Welcome to Leadership in Action, a series of interviews with law firm leaders on issues important to running a successful mid-sized law firm. These podcasts are part of the Managing Partner Series presented by Thomson Reuters in affiliation with the Managing Partner Forum and are hosted by John Remsen, Jr., CEO of the Managing Partner Forum and President of the Remsen Group. Our guest this month is Darren Klemchuk, founder and managing partner at Klemchuk LLP based in Dallas, Texas, specializing in intellectual property, technology, internet, and business law. Welcome, Darren and John. Well, thank you, Colleen. We appreciate your introduction. And Darren, thank you for being with us this afternoon. We really appreciate your uh, participation in our podcast series. Well, thank you both. I'm excited to uh, participate. Well, as we uh, get started, uh, give us a little background on the Clemchuck Law Firm, its history, some of your priorities as you look to the future. Well, we were uh, formed in on April 1st, 2009, at the height of the Great Recession. Uh, not great timing. Um, and we started out as a – we wanted to be one of the larger full-service intellectual property boutiques in Dallas, and ultimately our goal was to kind of dominate the Dallas market. We uh, grew uh, exponentially in the first three years. I think we 5 x our revenue and 4 x the number of people. Um, over that time, you know, when you have that much growth so fast, things get a little bit unstable. So we took a, a few years off to – put some processes in place, and then ultimately in, um, in January of 2015, a year ago, we um, some of the partners made a decision to go elsewhere. And so we restructured the firm uh, with a little bit different structure and a very, very different, uh, pretty creative law firm model in uh, January of 2015, and we've kind of rebranded as, as a little bit broader, more of a technology and business firm, which also includes intellectual property, but other things as well as transactional work. Well, it certainly sounds like you've got a very clear vision on what you're trying to build. And I think it's interesting you restructured your firm uh, recently to accomplish that. And um, as I understand it, you you basically, you know, took a look at your structure and, and kind of rebuilt it from scratch. And, and tell me why. What were the root causes that uh, led you to do that? Yeah, we, we almost completely overhauled the structure uh, to, to to arrive at this point. And, and it's somewhat of a long story, but a, a couple a couple of things happened that contributed to that. The first thing is, in uh, November, late November of 2013, I had a medical event um, where I should have died, uh, but I didn't, and that gave me a very different perspective on life, and I got very clear on what my priorities in life I'll, I'll were at the did. time. I'll bet it did. And cu- coupled with that is that I, I just really um, did not want to participate in what I would call the barbershop uh, model of a law firm, which is a is where the you know in a barbershop model there are multiple barbers. They all have large controls over what they want to do, but they're all also in- independent contributors and silos. And they don't really work together in a, a team environment. And I'm not saying that we were that model exactly. Um, but I, w- I was much more drawn to a team-based model like a sports team or a military unit would be run. And so um, because I hadn't, you know, I survived that medical event, uh, I was very motivated to try something completely different. And so we've modeled the law firm actually based on other kinds of businesses. And so over the course of the uh, – between the events in November 2013 and January of 2015, I shared the model – with everyone here, uh, two-thirds of the people wanted to do it and stayed, and a third wanted to pursue different models and left. And so in January of 2015, we were restructured, rebranded, and relaunched as a technology law firm. Wow. Interesting. I, I call that uh, barbershop model you describe as a hotel for lawyers uh, or Correct. an office-sharing arrangement with lots of autonomy and little right. sense of institution and firm first goals and objectives. And uh, yeah. I think to be successful and viable in this market, firms got to uh, get it together and, 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 and be more collaborative in terms of their, um, you know, working together and playing off each other's strengths and uh, bringing that team-based approach. Uh, so I applaud you. And, and what, what sort of provisions are in your partnership agreement, your compensation system, your governance model uh, to achieve this, this team, this team culture, this team-based kind of firm you're trying to build? Well, I, you know, I think the, I mean, the biggest challenge that, you know, I see, and this is, and I have friends in, in 
numerous law firms in Dallas, and, and most of them are, are are some level of hotel for lawyer model as you described it. Um, is just you know convincing people to move away from that because that that has been a dominant model that succeeded for over 100 years for lawyers. It so is. Any, Anything new is challenging and threatening. So getting people uh, to try something new, that in and of itself, and particularly for lawyers who are a risk of a sponge, is a difficult uh, move. Uh, the second thing is, in order to be on a team, you have to play a role. And to play a role, that means you have to give up certain things and focus on other things. And in fact, frankly, what you to be a very successful team player, you have to be willing to look somebody in the eyes, admit to your weaknesses and admit to your uh, strengths, leverage your strengths, and then hopefully – team with somebody or collaborate with somebody to uh, shore up your weaknesses or offload mm -hmm. the kinds of things mm -hmm. that you're not particularly good at. Mm -hmm. I have found that that is yet another thing that's very difficult to do with anybody, but lawyers in particular are hard because we're trained from law school on to have no weaknesses Yes. and, you know, to, to have those tough discussions about weaknesses, how people feel about certain things, and roles and self-sacrifice, it's just a very difficult to do, in it, I think, for lawyers. Did you use psychological profiles or any sort of self-assessment tools to help identify, you know, the various roles and strengths of, of, your, uh, of your team members? Yeah, we do. We use a tool called Culture Index. Uh, it's a very ha highly accurate predictive uh, and behaviorally predictive assessment. Um, and the way that we, we call it the grid, the partnership grid, is we, we structure the grid around – the types of behaviors that all law firms or really any professional service firm has to have to be successful. And there are really only four money-making activities. New client origination, or you can call that hunting. Uh, relationship management, or you can call that farming or matter origination. Project management, and then personal billings and service deliveries. Those four activities. And what I have found over about 19 years of practicing law is that most lawyers it can be very good or great at one, maybe two of the four, but I've never met anybody that's great at all four. And so that's mm -hmm. the discussion about weakness, teaming, roles, and all that. And so what we did is we correlated those four behaviors against uh, roles on a team within the partnership grid. And then most important thing was we linked those behaviors to variables in the compensation plan. So I was going to get to compensation because I'm sure each person thinks their particular contribution is more valuable than the next guy. Right. And so what we did, what we did, and this is uh, highly creative and different, is that we have actually have primarily two different compensation formulas. One is uh, a bias in favor of origination, either a new client or new matter origination. And the second one that's biased towards somebody that's a, that serves as a project manager who might bring in some clients and originate some matters, but predominantly is a project manager who manages people below them. Mm -hmm. And so the way that the grid is set up is that you get to pick, I don't pick for them, their role. So if you want to be an individual contributor, then the, you just can bill a lot or project, basically you bill a lot. Mm -hmm. You don't need to worry about bringing in new clients or even really even managing anybody. Mm -hmm. And that's that's your role on the team. If and hopefully you, you collect a lot too. Well, yeah, <laughs> it's obviously into the billing. You're, you're <laughs> yeah, this, getting paid this, on those bills. Which, right. So the I, the formula is based on collections, not billing, of course. There you go. That's important distinction. Okay. Right. And so if the if you want to be a project manager, then we have a position for that too, and the, and that we split origination with project manager. So. They get paid based on the, not only their own production, but predominantly based on the people that they are managing. So their mission in life is to get things done correctly, uh, on budget, and to maintain a, a healthy, good team of technicians that provide services to the client. The, other, the two other positions are uh, a relationship manager. So this is somebody who manages client relationships, and they don't necessarily have to be a project manager, so they, they can't or they or they can choose just to focus on origination. And then the last position is somebody that wants to bring in new clients and, and manage an entire practice area. So we require that practice area managers also have to be hunters. And then they, what they do is they basically collaborate with relationship managers, project managers, and individual contributors Boy. to run their practice areas. You know, Darren, I like what you've got going here because so often within law firms, the compensation system is one size fits all, and everybody is judged on the same criteria. 
And uh, I, I like your concepts. And I, I, I use the terms finders, minders, and grinders. And uh, right. they need each other. And uh, mm-hmm. often the finders are good at going out, bringing it in, but often neglect it. So you need to hand it off to somebody who's going to take good care of it, grow it. Uh, I've heard other consultants and, you know, law firm leaders throw in the term binder as well. So you got finders, minders, binders, and grinders. And um, right. I think it's great and extremely innovative, uh, the model you've come up with. And it's working very well, I'm, I'm assuming, for given your growth and, and success in the market. Yes, so far so good. I mean, we're one year into it. We've added we've added three uh, lateral partners uh, since we started a year ago. Um, mm-hmm. and we've built out four of our seven service lines or practice areas. They have we have leaders in each. Um, so it's it's gone really well. I mean, again, you know, this model that we put in place. I, I'm just not aware of another law firm that's. No, done I'm it. not either. And I've worked with hundreds of law firms, Darren. So you, what you're doing truly is uh, unique and innovative. And um, thanks for sharing with with our our listeners uh, what you, what, you, what you're building. And I'm wondering if as you kind of kind of people slot where they want to be and what they bring to the firm, is it a very formulaic process when we sit down and, and determine compensation, or is there a lot of subjectivity to it as well? Well, it's actually um, it's all three. Um, it's so the the variable comp is formulaic. It's a strict formula. So we pay draws that are just guesses at what somebody's going to earn. And then they can, um, if they earn more, then they get paid quarterly profits or quarterly distribution. So the bulk of the compensation is formulaic. And the reason why I like that is it gives you crystal clear clarity as to what is valued, how much is valued relative to something else, and there's never any guessing games about it. So people, and because we have multiple formulas, people can, um, they can basically get to choose their set of challenges that they want and the rewards that they get for those challenges. Then we also pay profits. I believe in sharing profit or upside with everybody because I think when everybody has skin in the game, they all perform better. And so um, the profit, the profits are shared based on the levels that a partner has chosen for him or herself. So individual contributors get the lowest amount. The level two, which would be a project manager, a relationship manager, get a higher amount because they're more leveraged than the individual contributor. And then if somebody's running a practice area, they get even more because they are even more leveraged and taking on more non-billable uh, load that is not captured in the formula. And so those those guys get even more than the um, service managers or, sorry, relationship managers and project managers. And as far as subjectivity is concerned, so here, here's the other challenge I've noticed with law firms, and this is, again, this is a professional service firm challenge, but it's that duality of owner and employee. Yes, yes. Because, it, yes. because it's very different, uh, yes, you know, what, and so I, and this was just a struggle that I'd, I'd had in the past, and so we get super clear on what it means to be an owner and what it means to be an employee. So we all have jobs um, that we need to do, and the job is how you get paid on your formula and you get your profit sharing. And then you have what it means to be an owner or, you know, either an equity or non-equity partner. And so what we did to get really clear on this is we wrote a memo, a short one, a two criteria, yeah, called what it means to be a partner. Mm-hmm. Eight things. And so we share that with any prospective hire, uh, and either they are attracted by it or repelled by it. Yeah. We don't really want to compromise on it. That's just the way it is. Uh-huh. And, then, and then, you know, we have that. And then so that's kind of the admission criteria or performance criteria. And then the second thing is, and this is just a big deal for me personally, is that I'm, I am very committed to the building that partnership team and having a healthy team that dynamics. And so we actually adopted a whole set of rules that we call the, the, the partnership rules of the road. And this is how we act. And it's, it separates our behaviors as owners versus our behaviors as employees. And so for, I'll just read you a simple example. So as owners, we um, are going to address partnership issues in the partnership group. They are not to be addressed with individual partners outside the group, and they are not to be brought into the business until we've all agreed to it and present a united front, for example. And you enforce that when people yes. talk out of school. Right. Because the enforcement is really, really important. I see a lot of firms with policies and procedures and such, but little enforcement, little accountability. Um, so and well, what happens is the, the leader loses all their credibility. If, let, let's say you have a rule 
I'm just going to make up an example. Let's say you have a rule that says that uh, you know, invoices must be sent by the 15th of the month, okay? And most employee or most lawyers send their invoices by the 15th of the month. But an equity partner decides that she's not going to send her invoices on the 15th, and she'll send them whenever she wants to send them. Mm-hmm. Well, then the, you know, an admin or like the chief, administ- chief administrative officer or whoever's in charge of, of uh, sending out the bill shows up in her office, and she says, look, I hear what you're saying, but, you know, I'm an owner, you're not, so hit the road, I'll send my bills whenever I want. And so that is an example of a crisis between the partner as an employee who has a rule that says that she needs to send her invoices out on the 15th and the partner as an owner who just played the owner's card to get out of the rules. And so what I am hoping to do through this, what it means to be a partner and then these partnership rules of the road, is to eliminate as much as possible those kinds of problems. Although it's not, you know, we're all humans, so it's not entirely 100% it's possible. It's true, that. And, and, um, but that accountability is so, so important. And uh, one of my favorite managing partners of all time, a fellow named Brian Burke, uh, who ran Baker Daniels in Indianapolis prior to the Fagri merger, talks about, you know, one of your most important contributions of leader of the firm is that of keeper of the culture of your firm. Right. The culture defined largely by what you're willing to tolerate. And if you're willing to tolerate underperformance, rule-breaking, rogue behavior, what do you got? And you said it earlier, your, your credibility as a leader really becomes undermined if you don't enforce and hold people accountable uh, to firm, um, you know, firm firm policy and such. Darren, I really uh, really appreciate your sharing uh, so much about what you're building, and it sounds like, as, as I mentioned, a really creative model, and uh, i got to think it's very, very attractive to uh, to lawyers out there as you go about recruiting and, and building building your firm for success. Um, we're starting to run out of time here, but before um, I let you get away, um, I, I, what advice would you give a firm leader, a managing partner who's dealing with some uh, rule-breaking, uh, perhaps some dysfunction within the firm. Um, well, what advice would you give that that firm leader? There's a uh, business consultant in Dallas. His name is Rand Stegen, and did, I was at a, a Rand presentation a little over two years ago, and he made this this point that a leader gets the organization that he or she deserves. <laughs> Put another way, that the organization can never perform better than the the state of the leader. And so at the end of the day, it's ultimately the leader's responsibility. So what I would suggest is first, you know, really work on yourself to be a better leader because, you know, you are the limiting factor on your law firm. And then you second, set the tone. you set the pace. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you, you can't, can't, you know, you know I, I'm not a big, I'm not, I know that there are leadership models that, that you know, the autocratic do as I say model, uh, I know that it can be effective like in emergencies and other times, but I've always thought that a good leader needs to lead by example. So, you know, you, it all starts with you. Um, I, here's what I'd recommend is that, you know, if you have clarity of vision on what this firm means, how we organize as partners, where are we headed, how do we distribute profits, things along those lines, what, how do we act as owners versus act as employees, once you get clarity on the big things, it's a lot easier. If you're unwilling to address the real issues in the partnership or the lack of cohesiveness in the vision or the fact that there are four different visions, then you're kind of sunk. So you either have to you know, accept it and deal with it and make the best of it, or you need to do the hard work, which is address those real issues and get everybody on board as much as possible with the vision. And if some people aren't on board, then you may have to make the tough decision that the firm as a whole is better off without them. And those are tough decisions, and uh, those are decisions I'm grappling with more and more as mid-sized firms recognize, you know, we're not running a fraternity. Uh, it's not tenure to become an equity partner. You, you have to pull your weight. You have to set a good example, and more and more firms, I think, are starting to really step up and, and run more like a business and, and less like that, uh, you know, barbershop you described uh, at the outset of our conversation. Uh, Darren, thanks so much uh, for sharing uh, your your tips and strategies and some of the things your firm's doing, and uh, we really, really appreciate it. Thank you for joining us for this edition of the Managing Partners Series, Leadership in Action. For more information and resources, visit LegalSolutions.com backslash managing partner.